Hi. Chapter 12. All about long-term liability. Namely, we're going to hit into bonds and uh, a little bit of installment sales or notes. Kind of like your mortgage. Pretty much right at the end. So, a bond in itself is a, basically a term of financing. This is what we call debt finance. So, we take on debt to basically pay off certain items and get money very quickly. Again, mostly it's going to be with corporations that do this. Kind of like in our next chapter, uh, chapter 13 after the exam next week, uh, would be uh, over stock and equity. So we're doing one side and then we'll get to the other uh, in the next chapter. But when we look at bonds themselves, a bond is usually going to be purchased by investors. And these investors typically will get a good deal in a lot of ways due to this. When they purchase a bond, a corporation not only will give the par value of that bond, or face value, I typically go face value a lot of times, but, uh, They'll give that back to you, pay that to you, plus interest over the life of the bond. And usually this is going to be paid semi-annually, which again is twice a year, so that's not too bad. Now, the best bonds, of course, are uh, city bonds, or municipal bonds, and you want to look at those, because again, Cities, states, and the U.S. government, which will be treasury bonds, they don't go bankrupt. So you're at least guaranteed to get your money somewhat back. Now, when we look at these, again, the corporation, besides paying these, they're going to issue you out a nice little certificate, we can say. And that's actually the bond certificate, and I'll show you an example of what that has. But there's also a bond indenture that typically comes with it. And this is our contract uh, with the company. And these are always going to specify all sorts of rights, regulations, and procedures that are tied to both parties. The main ones for the investors are when do they get to claim their uh, percentage of the company's assets in a bankruptcy? Also, what would happen if the company decides to default on a payment? Which basically means you're not paying uh, your investors the interest. Now, if you don't pay the par value, well, at the end, at maturity, that could lead to some legal matters. And we're just making good money. We'll have to say that. So, what does a bond certificate look like? Well, so this is one example. Uh, this is what you're both using for Smart Touch, which was their overall example. We're just going to be mixing it up now with some other companies in this chapter, but. Here, they have a typical bond, a nice pretty one, I say that. But the most key things that we look for is maturity date. And maturity date itself is basically when is this document due or expires. So the end of the life. So this bond will expire on December 31st 
of 2022. Okay. And also we'll write the face value. So here's the face value on a thousand dollars. And somewhere in all this legal stuff, you will also see an annual stated interest rate. So this is our interest rate. We call it stated rate. We call it coupon rate. It's got a lot of nice fancy names. And of course, the certificate number. So we can keep track. And we'll provide everything that basically the bond is for. So again, what you're purchasing with this bond. Now, cool fact, little history lesson here, because it doesn't show everything, is that there's a reason why we call it a coupon rate. As you can see here, coupon payment says interest sometimes. And that's because back in when bonds were first being issued, they had a little, a little peripheral paper, if that's how you say it. But basically, it's little squares you take tear off when your interest is due. And so it looks like coupons. So you take one off, you send it to the company, the company will send you the, pay, the interest paid check. This is mostly because bonds do get traded a lot. And sometimes even the corporations cannot keep track of who has the bonds back in the early days. Now everything's done by electronics. We can basically keep track. Back in the old days, you, have, you wanted your interest payment and had to sit in the coupon. So that's a nice little thing, old school. But speaking on the exchange, bonds do get traded, just like stock. And they have their markets. And you want, if you ever want to get into finance, you may end up catching these bond quotes. And really, a lot of times, it's just knowing what it is speaking of. So here, is an IBM bond. This is how it's going to show up on the market. It's got a rate of uh, 4%, which is basically its interest rate. So if I purchase in this bond, I will get a 4% interest from it. So those will be my payments. This is the maturity. That's going to mature in 2042. So Quite a long time. Right now, the yield is basically if the, how much money is the bond yielding? Is it good or is it bad? Kind of thing. Uh, right now, this one is still a good bond. And you have the volume, which again is how much is the bond or how much dollars. And this one's going to be uh, 110000 And right now, the close is basically the biggest part. This will tell us if it's selling at a premium or discount. Depending where it is, either above 100 which is selling more than face value, or if it's less than 100 don't sell less. So what does that mean? Well, let's do a couple of concept checks. Are basically how do we figure out the bond price? Okay. So, taking out the calculator. And the calculator always has stuff in it. There it is. And this is how you figure out the bond price. Now, these quotes which you will probably see in your homework. Even though they look like whole numbers, these are actually percentages. Again, they like to do it like a whole number because it kind of looks better. But really, with these, we're going to take the face value, our par value, 
and we're getting that 1,000 buy. We're going to sell it. It's selling at 103.08, which is just basically uh, the wrong times 1.0308. So again, since it's above 100, I can expect basically the price to be above 1,000, which it is. A thousand thirty twenty cents. Likewise, again, if I look at that ninety five, that's ninety five percent. So times it by point nine five, convert it to decimal, and that bond, if it's basically selling at ninety five percent or ninety five. Is selling actually for 950 bucks. So in the end, if I'm an investor, I'm gonna make an additional 50 dollars once this bond matures because I only paid 950 for it. Again, that's what is in the bed. Okay. Now, <laughs> in the market, there is a lot of different types of bonds. And some of these bonds are included in your book. The one that we're going to pretty much take on is a term bond. And these bonds will mature at a specific time. Or mostly if there's a lot of these bonds, they all mature at the same time. So, example was 100,000 of term bond may all mature five years from today. Basically, it is. What we're going to deal with mostly. Now, you can have cereal bonds. I'm not talking about the cereal you have for breakfast. No, no, these aren't lucky charms. These are a different kind of cereal. And these cereal bonds mature actually in installment. So in any time you hear cereal, it's uh, S-E-R-I-A-L. That just means a series, okay? So, for example, a 500,000 five-year cereal bond may mature actually in 100,000 annual installments over a five-year period. So every year you at least get a hundred thousand back. You also have secured bonds, and these bonds are give basically give the bondholder the right to take specific assets. So you add a little bit of collateral to your bond to get it basically sold. And debentures. These bonds are unsecured bonds and not backed by any assets. They're really only backed by the credit worthiness of the bond issuer. So sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. So secured bonds, yeah, we can go with, but others we may have to watch out for. So why would companies do this? Companies may not be doing this because there is quite a few advantages to bonds. Now, there is some disadvantages, but when we compare it to our equity, we can find that has a little bit more. So, what are the advantages? First off, even though we're getting investors, for these bonds, they don't actually affect ownership control. Because these bonds are, again, a liability. They're not part of our equity. So we're not issuing out stock, which can basically delude our ownership. So these people have no say over anything we do. Okay? So that's the advantage over equity. Next, that interest that we have to pay, yes, we have to pay it, 
it's actually fully tax deductible. So we're actually in the end can save us some taxes. Which is nice. On the flip side, and you can see in equity or stock sales, the only way we can pay our stockholders is through dividends, which is a non taxable item. So that's actually no good. <laughs> Doesn't help us. So another plus for bonds. Also, we actually have something called return on equity. Okay? And bonds can really increase this very well. And when they do this, and it helps with the financial leverage. So again, it makes your shareholders basically happy because they know that they're making more money. Because their stocks worth more. So we got this nice little example. We're going to assume that the following company has 1000 in equity and is planning a 500 expansion of its facility. Income before interest expense will increase from 100 to 225 due to this nice expansion. Now, we have two plans. Plan B decides we're going to finance this through equity. Well, Plan C is going to say, let's do a bond. Now, when we look at return on equity, remember that's net income divided by equity in itself. So before we do any of the financing, this is currently what it is. We had 100 income divided by that 1,000 equity. Gives us only a 10% return on equity for our shareholders. And with plan B, with equity financing. Basically, again, out of the scenario, does increase 225, but it's being divided by 1,500. This is due to the selling of stock. We sold 500 stock because it's equity finance. Now, it does increase the return on equity up to 15%, not bad, but it's also diluting ownership for people. Now, plan C, again, it increases to 225. Now, we do have to pay the interest in itself of $50, or not dollars, but $50 million, and this is in millions. And this gives us to 175, but that divided by the 1,000, since we did equity finance, we didn't increase the number, actually gives us a better return of 17.5%. Sweet. So again, shareholders are happy. They rather pay the interest or have the company pay and still basically make, right now, 7.5% higher than what they were. So, but also bonds can have some disadvantages and some disadvantages and attack the same thing. And this is mostly if somehow losses do happen. So if the interest was more and it caused a loss, anything like that, and you can reduce ROE and turn this negative if need be. So we do have to watch out. Again, this is where financial planners come in hand. Us as accounts what financial background is they make a quite a bit of money. So the other major disadvantage of bonds is of course those cash payments, okay, you are required to pay those. 
So that pays the interest, and when it matures, you must pay par. That's because it's a legal contract. Problem is, those years when that happens, that's going to be a stranglehold on our cash flows. Basically, it's going to be harder for us to operate. Yeah, that's just how it is. So this becomes a very big advantage for equity finance, where remember the payments to stockholders are dividends, and they are not required to be actually paid. Dividends are not required. Okay? A company can go years without paying a dividend. So don't have the pressure. So it is chalk one up for equity finance. But we will get into that in the next chapter. So, that's our advantages and disadvantages. But how do we figure out that price? Hmm. Now, remember I already mentioned that we can have premiums and discounts. But this is all compared to the rates. Okay. So we have our contract rate, or basically our stated rate, versus the market rate. And when we look at these, these help determine uh, about bond price. And again, We'll look at these, but there's three scenarios. So, first off, if the contact rate, or the stated rate, is greater than the market rate, that bond is going to sell for a premium. If the contract rate is equal to the market rate, it's going to sell at par. And then if it's less than the market rate, don't sell at a discount. So, oh, I like to relate this to those who are as shoppers. But again, if I can relate it to your real life, that thing works. So, let's go to holidays. I oh, probably went shopping on the holidays. Good old Black Friday. You know how it runs. Now, when we like to say something selling as premium, if you ever look at the market, there's always a hot toy. Kids want it to be anything. But somehow, it always runs out everywhere. So you have to go to good old eBay. And since there's a higher demand for that product, Everybody on eBay is going to jack up the price. Basically, sell it above retail. And you're willing to buy it because, again, you cannot find it. This is how the bonds work. This is like if Apple issues out a bond. Although I'm not going to go bankrupt, which we hope not, because society will crumble. But <laughs> basically, more people will want that bond because it gives them better security and guarantee. So again, that bond is going to sell above par. When we look at par value in itself, basically selling equal, as a seller, that's mostly us going, our buyer, going to the grocery store and just saying, yeah, I agree with retail, I'm going to buy it. I mean, I'm not going to argue with it, it's okay. I agree to buy it at retail price. Last part, the discount. Discount should be easy. Because again, this is us as buyers basically going to a store and waiting until Black Friday when it does go on discount. Because we're going, it's not worth its retail price. I mean, I'd rather wait until it goes on sale or is on clearance, somewhere I can get cheaper than what it was originally selling for. The same thing with bonds. Some companies, 
people won't want to buy a bond from. So they're trying to get at the a lower price than what they are. So other factors that we look at. Now, I can say this with a premium. Bad story. Tickle me Elmo. Y'all know what Tickle me Elmo is? Y'all live in a rock. But if you did, back when eBay was in its infancy, Tickle me Elmo became the hottest toy. Those dolls were selling over a thousand dollars on eBay because it was so hot. In fact, mostly, if you ever saw the, the movie Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sinbad, that was really what it was based on. How crazy holiday get. Ooh. But when we look at the market rate, it's also called the effective rate sometimes. But when we look at this, there's a big thing that's on it, and that's risk. And risk deals with credit agencies, just like us. We have our credit score. Well, businesses also have theirs. And these credit scores can basically determine how well your bond is going to sell or even stock. Because a like, poor credit rating is not good. Just like with us. We want the highest credit score so that banks will lend us money. Same thing here. Companies want the highest credit score so we lend them money. And the main three is, of course, Moody, S&P, and Finch. And this is just an example so you can see how these credit scores look like. But, again, a low credit score, so something that's a BB plus or BA1, how Ruby does it, because they might be different. If it's below this, stack over at night, it is known as a junk bond, which means basically a very high risky bond. So if you're a gambler, you can basically buy one of these bonds, and you want to make a lot of money if they, the company survives to pay it. <laughs> And right now, I think in the news a few weeks ago, you may have heard uh, that AMC Theaters, which is there in the Deerbrook Mall for us, their credit rating just lowered. And that was big news because this could be basically bankruptcy territory for AMC Theaters because of credit rating lower. It has a lot of implications. Again, a lot of people want the prime, high grade, upper middle grade, even treasury bonds and municipal bonds will be a credit rating. Yeah. How well are you going to get your money back? So, everybody still with me? They're still feeling froggy? Any questions so far of all these definitions? Y'all ready to get to the accounting part, huh? Okay, now for the backstory of what they are, let's actually do some examples of how do we account for a bond. And this is not too terribly hard. I want to say this. It's a little bit easier than what we've been doing. But we're going to go ahead and hit it. So we're going to use a company called Big Blue Backpack. So Big Blue. It's big and it's blue. Definitions are always, they can always show up on multiple choice. So, on the workout problems, it's pretty much going to be what we actually do. But remember, so typically there's big questions 
close to what you saw in prison. Okay? Again, just asking you what this is, what could be this, how to do this, so forth and so on. And again, for the exam, you will have 20 of those. Okay? All right. All right, all right, all right. Let's see. How do we issue a bond at our value, our face value? Usually when it tells us a bond, like this one, they're going to tell us it's been issued for how much money. This one's been issued for 100K of 8% three-year bond. So it's going to mature in three years, basically 2021. And this percentage is, of course, its interest rate. Now, this is going to, of course, pay semi-annually. So every two years, not every two years, every six months. Ugh. And the bond was issued at 100 or at par. So whenever it's issued at 100, that is base value. Basically 100% of par. Okay? So when we write these, First off, never forget your dates. So we're going to start with debiting cash. Usually that's what we're getting, is cash. Next, we're going to credit. Payable. Balance. Payable. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's a bad joke, but it's the only time I can use it. Because y'all don't know the account yet. But either way, we do credit an account called Bonds Payable. Again, to show that we owe this bond. Now, Bonds Payable is always the face value, so par value. And in both, so you know that it's the same word anyway. But it's always par value. No matter what, we're going to see that when we get into premiums and discounts. Okay? Next, how do we calculate interest? All right, so again, we got to pay interest every six months, so twice a year. Interest for a bond is calculated a little bit different than it is for um, our notes. So this is actually par value times the contract rate, our stated rate. However, you want to go with those with the terms. And it's usually divided by however many payments we do during the year. Since semi is usually the common one, we're just going to go ahead and go by two. So, in other words, this bond was 100000 Interest rate was 0 0.08. So that means Every year, we're going to pay $8,000 in interest. But we need to figure out for this particular interest payment. So we're going to divide by two, which gives us four grand. Okay, so that is our cash interest payment. Again, this is just one formula that we use. There it is. So when we do this, of course, we're paying. Oh, there's our cash. That's a credit. And we're going to debit interest expense. Because interest expense is increasing and gives us that lovely deduction that we still want. 
Now, funny part about this is once you figure out that first interest payment, the next interest payments are exactly the same. So every six months, we're going to make this journal entry for the payment until the note is matured. So this will be June 30th, December 31st, 2019, then June 30th, 2020, December 31st, 2020. In June 30th of 2021 and December 31st of 2021. Now, funny thing about December 31st of 2021, even though that's going to have an interest payment, that's also the date of this note's maturity. But basically, again, the end of the line. So, On December 31st is 2021, our bond matures, and we pay off the bond. So, when we pay off the bond, on the car, it's almost a flip of this. So again, bond payable has to be debit. We paid off the liability. So it's always going to be, again, Base value when it reaches maturity. And of course, the only way we're going to pay it off is through cash. So, there's selling a, um, basically issuing a bond and retiring it at par value. Any questions on this one? Not overly difficult in part. Of course, are you going to see a lot of bonds being sold at par? Probably not. So, let's do what happens when it sells for a discount. So, below par value. Now, when it is sold for a discount, how can you see this as an expense of issuing the bond? Again, basically, you're going to have to pay back more than the money you receive in the end life of the bond. So, to help out companies, we actually increase interest expense. But in order to do so, we have to amortize the discount. And we amortize it is going to be under a straight line method. So the best way to do it is we're going to take a new account called Discount on Bonds Payable and divide by total number of bond payments. Okay? Or basically how many times are we going to pay interest throughout the life of bond. And then I'll get the current value right after it. But let's go ahead and do this. So big blue for our H out the same bond. And this time, notice, so at 100, it's selling at 96.4. So below 100, this you got. So this is how we're going to figure out our cash again. So taking our handy dandy calculator, we're going to take it 100K. And multiply it by 90, or 0.964. Then remember the percentage. So I see it below 100. My cash should be below our value. If it's way above it, you may want to check where you put your decimal at here. Okay? So similar to par. I'm going to debit cash for 96400 I'm also going to credit bond payable 
provides par value. Again, always par value for bonds payable. As you can see, my debits and credits do not match. So I need to find the difference. So, 100,000 minus 96,400 will show I have 3,600 that needs to be account for. Well, I do know in order to balance debits and credits, this is going to show up here as a debit when it does. This also tells us that a discount has happened. So discount on pay on payable. Okay. And here is the formulas right there. Okay. But that's basically our issue. So I want to tell you this with premiums. Not much difference. You won't see that. But now we have to figure out our first interest payment. So here's some formulas that are going to happen. We're going to have to advertise the discount on bonds payable. But don't forget, we still have to do the cash payment. Okay. And cash interest payment again is par value times the stated rate divided by how many payments we do during the year, so again, two. So we know cash. Cash is our credit. Okay. The only other things we got to do is figure out how much are we going to advertise discount. So, Easy way. I'm going to take that 3600 and we're going to divide it. Now, this bond is going to last for three years. That's what's stated. So, since it's going to last for three, you know, we can take three times by how many payments we make a year, which is, of course, two. So, that's going to be the denominator on the bottom of the division. So basically it's 3,600 divided by 6. So every interest payment we make, we're going to amortize by 600. And this is the formula that we did. Right there. All right, now, our goal is to make this chunk of bond payable basically to zero. So if it's already a debit, how am I going to put this 600 to start reducing this? Where is that going to go in this journal entry? Will it be a debit or credit? Yeah, it's going to be a credit to the story debit. I will make it down to zero. Okay? So, for discounts on bonds payable, since this is being amortized out, or basically being reduced slowly to zero, being allocated, we will credit it on the interest payments. On the issuing, it's going to be a debit. Okay, so anytime we're trying to get rid of it and make it to zero. Okay. So we have two credits and no debit. Well, this does mean that debit one has to be interest expense. With these interest payments, we basically have a discount. We're going to add the discount plus the cash. So the amortization of the account plus the cash. This means our interest expense is four thousand six hundred. 
Okay, again, got increased our expense to sell at discount. So the big things to watch out for, and again, make sure you calculate the cash correctly on the issuance, and then find the difference for the discount, which is a debit. And then on here is making sure you can amortize it correctly. Okay. Now, payments two through six, guess what? They are not going to change again. So, they are exactly the same until maturity. The only thing we have to watch out for right now is what we call carrying value. You're like, going, what's carrying value? Well, it's the same thing as book value. And remember the fixed assets. And where we take the par value, so how much the bond for, we're going to minus by unamortized discount. Okay? So discount that we haven't allocated yet. Which gives us these nice little uh, charts here. I just forgot the word to them. Amortization charts. There we go. Ah, schedule. But basically what's going on? This is what's happened to the carrying value over the life of the bond. Every time we make our payments, we're slowly reducing this. Uh, on amortized. So it's going down by 600 each payment. So it reaches zero. Okay? So last payment, there should be no more on amortized discount. At the same time, the carrying value, since we're subtracting, will slowly raise. Because our goal is to get the carrying value on the books to match our value. So this is why we amortize out. Basically this account should exist. But it does. And it slowly goes away. So again our goal is to get 100 paid. So this means this. At maturity. It is only going to be on table of 100k in cash. Okay. Same thing as par. At maturity, it should only be the face value left. Hey, okay. that was a discount. A little bit of tricky stuff there. But guess what? You can learn discount or premium it actually gets very, very close to each other. So, what happens when it sells at premium? First off, the cash that we're going to receive, again, is going to be greater than our value. Basically, we got an additional benefit from it. We got more money. So, of course, we're going to have to decrease the expense because we've already got a benefit for it. We can't double dip the benefits. We will also amortize premiums just like we did on a discount. Okay. And then we also have to figure out carrying value. Their form is a little bit different since it is above par. We actually add the unamortized premium. So this counts we subtract, premiums we add. Again, I'll show you how that all works. So here's our big blue. And this time, they issued the bond at 130.60. So again, I can tell it's a premium because it's over 100%. 
So again, same steps. Uh, par value times and percent in decimal form for that 103. 1.0360, which again, as you can see, shows that the cash that we receive is above 103 or 100,000 above par. Again, I debit cash and I credit bonds payable, and I can see a difference. Either a lot easier when they're Old numbers like this, but here I can tell right away the difference is again 3,600. But this time we need to add it to the credit to balance to the amount of cash we receive. So there's our 3,600. But when this happens, this also tells me there's a premium. So if the difference ends up being a credit, premium. The difference has to be a debit, discount. Again, if you have those, they're hidden right there is the formula. Okay. So premium, just a little bit different than discount, but still the same structure. So when we Figure out the interest payment. Again, we always figure out the cash payment first, which is still the same uh, uh, the same basically procedure of the par value times the rate divided by again how many times we pay during the year, which is typically two. So it's still four thousand. Next. We would amortize the premium, same way we did with the discount. So there's our 3,600 premium divided by three years times two payments per year. So put that in 600. So here's our premium. Now, it's going to be flipped and discount. So if it starts out as a credit, again, I have to make it to zero. I have to do exactly the opposite. So this will be a debit. So again, it's reducing. Or basically, it's being allocated out. So this is down there now on the same side. So I have to find a difference. 4,000 minus 600 is, of course, 3,400. And this is your interest expense. Okay. So what is the discount up here? Interest expense is going to be greater than your cash payment. Okay. But with a premium, pretty much expect your interest expense is going to be a less than the cash payment. Okay. Whew. And again, payment through two through six are exactly the same. So it's always getting past the first hurdle. Once you figure out once, it's just copy and paste. Life is easy when it's that way. Okay. Just make sure the company pays and not just write the journal entry. So that's our job is to make sure the company pays. So carrying value for these bonds, sell out premium. Their amortization schedule would be something similar to this. Again, our, our carrying value, so basically our book value of the bond, when it's a premium, is par value plus unamortized premium. 
where it's sold for more. Of course, the first date is always the start. So there's our cash, there's our premium. And throughout the course of the life, the unamortized premium will go down. But since we started the carrying value above our par, which is where we need to go, that's our goal. You're going to notice under this amortization schedule, it will also slowly reduce. Remember, it's got to hit our goal. Our discount is the original carrying value, which of course is the cash for that, starts below. And so its goal to is to make part. So this is why it increases every year. So this guy gets a par. The race to the par. But at maturity level, well, at the end of the life, no matter if it's a par, discount, or premium, guess what? Same journal tree. So, they really do end up becoming the same. Again, here's a nice practice problem for y'all. I want to give it a shot. Try and do this probably on a piece of paper. So the answers are built into the notes. All right. So any questions on discount or premiums? Again, if somehow a question does pop in the brain, you can always ask it in the chat room, and I can always go back, okay? So, in a perfect world, bonds will always make it to maturity. They will always reach retirement. Okay, so what we call retirement of a bond. But this is an imperfect world. And some bonds actually retire before maturity, or before it's in life. These bonds have a special name. They're called callable bonds. And callable bonds in themselves, which of course has to be part of the contract, is when the company can basically say, hey, we're going to go ahead and pay the bond early. We, we want it back. And mostly the reason behind this is, again, interest payments. Basically, they can do a lower interest rate in certain things when the economy makes it so. So if the market interest rate falls, they, again, can sell it at a lower interest rate. So they'll call back the bonds, basically reissue them. But that comes at a cost. Okay? When we call the bond, when a company does this, they usually have to pay a premium. This is called a call premium to compensate for the lost interest to the investor. Okay? It's not going to be all the interest that you would have made. Again, it's just going to be like an added tax fee. So this does mean gains and losses can happen on retirement. This really just depends upon the current carrying value. So currently what the book value is. So I actually don't remember if that was chapter I think it was chapter nine for us. Um but we're going to take Big Blue, and they're going to take that 100,000 bond that's already been basically sold, and basically for the premium. That's how we're going, because it has an amortized premium. Gosh. And they're going to 
call it back. They're going to charge or basically pay a 3% call premium. Okay. This is going to be very similar to how we dealt with fixed assets. And when we basically sold them or discarded them. Back in chapter 9, or the previous chapter, because we actually skipped the current liabilities. All right. With this, on January 1st, 2020, we won, we had to pay a call premium. Okay? So this tells us how much cash we had to pay. So, calculate this. Basically, let's take the hundred thousand times by point zero three. This is a three percent callback. So we have paid an additional three grand for our car. So three thousand in plus our car value. That's a wonderful a hundred and three thousand. All right, we know that. We also know some more information. And that's this. We know bonds payable. Again, always face value. Okay, because that has to go. We also know unamortized premium of these bonds. So if there's no more bond, there's no more premium. So this has to totally reduce to zero. So just like our interest payments, this means we would do a debit and to make it zero. If this was a discount, it was credit, naturally. Now, as you can see, carrying value of the bond is usually the payable plus the premium. Okay? And it's this. I actually did add those together. They don't come up to 103,000. That's 102,400. So, we need to find the difference. So basically, we have 102, 400, minus 103. Would show us we lost money. Yay, boo. I'm going to cry. But we lost, whoa, $600 there as the calculator kind of goes. Yeah, take out the screen. So, when we lose money, then just like fixed assets, this is known as a loss on bond retirement. So uh, that is the difference between carrying value and the cash received. If you want to get that way, or basically what would balance out right? debits and credits. Now, if this was a credit, of course, that would mean a gain has happened. Okay? I have to watch out for those. They love to separate out this account. Well, basically, that's what I did. Okay. Again, biggest thing to watch out on retirement before maturity date is, of course, what your current carrying value is. Now, most likely it will not match your cash, so you probably will have a loss or a gain. Overall, basically, yes. Same thing as selling a fixed asset. And that's it, the bonds. Really, all we're going to tackle. So, next, we're going to hit the last little part, which, of course, is the notes. And the other debt way. 
the other. So with this way, we have long-term notes. Remember, anything that's long-term is going to be basically greater than one year or one accounting period. So again, they're very similar to bonds in the way that they will take financing, but they're usually from a bank. Those are the long-term notes. Now, if it's like the notes that we've done in previous chapters, which we'll have gone over a little bit if we, if the schedule did not fit for short term, uh, liabilities, but basically no payable regular loan. If it's a loan that's more than a year, we do have to split it. We'll have something called current portion of notes payable. And this is basically what part of the note is payable within one year. So it's constantly changing. This allows us to tell investors, again, how much are we paying in the year. So, but the rest is still yet to come. And we'll have an amortization schedule. We're going to show one in a sec. But so that's mostly if it's a regular note. But there's another type of long-term notes. And this is going to be called an installment cell. So installment note. So here's our amortization of the long-term note. Where you can have a beginning balance, principal payment, which is always going to be the same. But you have tacked on interest. And interest basically will reduce, but the total payments are going to be different. It's a nice little chart that shows you everything that's happening about paying a note. And there's our classic interest. So I want to look at installment notes. They're a little bit different. The note receivable or any other notes that we've done. And that's because the payments for those, unlike the note, long term note, is that it doesn't change. The payments are the same. Okay? The things that change is how much goes to principal and how much goes to interest. Okay, these are your typical car notes. Okay, I know all of y'all probably would have to pay for a car sometime. Notice that you always pay exactly the same amount of money pretty much every month. A portion will go to interest and a portion will go to the principal of the note. Same thing if you ever have to take out student loans. These are known as installment notes. We make exactly the same payment, but we again we have to figure out. Now usually they're going to calculate under time value of money principles, but we're, due to time constraints because of what has happened, we're going to steer clear of those. That is, if you want to know more though, that is in the appendix section of this book, and you can go ahead and give a good read. That's figuring out present value and future value. Basically what you would learn in a finance class. Okay. But due to time constraints, again, can't go too much into that. So, we're going to do a simple amortization schedule. Again, something that you could do in Excel if you know the formulas. We're going to take this note. Our big blue, they're going to borrow 80000 from First National Bank to purchase some equipment. It's usually why we do an installment note in the first place. It's going to sign a 6% installment note 
on January 1st, 2019, and requiring three annual payments of 29000 that should be in comma, 928 and 79 cents, which of course includes principal and interest. We're going to make this nice and solid schedule. First off, we know we have three payment dates. So we only have three payments. And we already know the cash amount. Again, we're going to pay these off. So what we need to do first is figure out the beginning balance. Which is eighty thousand. Okay. Next, we take this beginning balance and multiply it by the interest rate. So, if I take eighty thousand times point zero six, comes out about forty eight hundred. There we go. Okay, so there's our interest portion of the payment. Next, how much of that uh, payment goes to principal? Well, the way to find out is we take the principal payment, or not principal payment, but the cash payment, 29928.79, and just check the interest we've already figured out. So this amount goes to your principal. Again, if you want reference, you can look up your car note and you're going to see payments are going to be the same way. Portion goes to interest, portion goes to reducing your basically balance or your principal. So what is my ending balance? What plus are my notes? Well, this is taking now the beginning and subtracting out our principal payment, the portion to principal, our reduction to notes payable. If this was a note, 25, 1, 8, 1, 7, 9. So that means I'm left with 54,871.21. Oh, so again, next year, this is now our beginning. And we'll multiply by the rate, since this is just the second payment. Do the same, take from our cash to subtract the interest. And there's our principal payment. Which again reduces how much left on the note to 20,234.69. Now, again, since this is an installment note, remember it only has three payments. Notice this usually in the last year, your ending balance of the note, which again shows the beginning. Is going to be actually less than the actual cash payment, which means this. In the last year, the beginning balance is your reduction. There's no multiplying by interest rate. Okay? The reason why, again, since this is the last year, we have to make it to zero. So we basically pay off our note, and whatever is remaining from the cash payment subtracted by the principal will be considered interest that year. Again, this is all what the contract and what space. So interest ends up being 1694 And if a banker is really good, they would do it well enough to make it interest expense, but basically just be careful of that last year on installment note. So 
These amortization schedules also help us with the journal entry. It basically provides all the factors we want. So, start off, you always have to show the acceptance of the note. So, cash and credit notes payable. Okay. So, there's our acceptance. Next. We have our interest. This is the first payment. We already know right there. We know the note table is being reduced. Again, according to the amortization schedule. And then finally, we're going to credit for the cash payment. Which, again, right here. Okay. And if you want to, always with the payment, just to double check to make sure you're grabbing back your credit. Now, another big um, installment type note is, of course, your mortgage. And your book wants to be very specific on basically determine the difference between the two. So if you do have a mortgage question, make sure that using notes payable, you use mortgage payable. Again, since it's a different type of loan anyway, be careful and make sure you put mortgage. So you're dealing with the mortgage. Here we're dealing with the note. And tell us that we borrow the grant and an installment note. All right, there is another content check here. Let's go out. So, in the end, here's what the balance sheet's going to look like. So, here's our current liabilities. Again, there is no order to the madness for these. Here's our current portions. So these are again the mortgage and the long term note that is due within one year. Okay. And then they list our long term. So note payable, 15000 Since this is a long term note, really how much we owe is 20K. Just 5,000 is current. Okay. And there's your mortgage. And then here's our bill bond payable. So this one actually does show the 100K minus a discount on bonds payable of 3,081 to give us our net. We'll find your net long term liability. Okay. Ooh. All right. Last but not least is, of course, our debt to equity ratio, or basically the ratio for this chapter, or we get the last chapter. That is in chapter 15 which does a lot of analysis statistics. But with this, this ratio itself, that's to equity. Basically, it's a proportion of total liabilities divided by total equity to find our financial leverage. Again, similar to return on equity, which is net income divided by Correctly, this one really does figure out how are we financing everything? Really, that's the question. So, if the ratio is greater than one, we're financing more assets with debt, so either notes 
loans, or bonds than we are with equity. If somehow it becomes less than one, we're financing it through mostly equity, but mostly through stock sales, stockholders. The problem with this is that the higher the ratio, the greater the company's financial risk. Remember, if you take on too much debt, you may not be able to pay it off and could cause bankruptcy. So we do have to watch out on this ratio. So for them, they take this lovely example, and this again is numbers from Kohl's from 2016-2015. And they basically give us some total liabilities and total equity of each year. And they show, we take it, total liabilities in 2015. And January 30th, so, yeah, a little bit, well, it doesn't really do the years properly, but their end date is Again, for 2015, probably in January, but we'll go with it. But 8,115 divided by 5,491 shows us 1.48. Well, in the previous year, about the same time, it was 1.39. So we know that we have quite a bit of debt going on. A debt finance, because again, it's greater than one. But it looks like in what would have been considered the current year, or 2015, it does look like they've taken on more debt. They have more debt financing. Even though that's less, the ratio is more. They have more of a financial risk in 2015. But really, that's really the analysis that we do. The big thing is, is to know the formula and know which numbers we're plucking out. Okay. So that actually wraps up Chapter 12. Is there any questions over Chapter 12 at all? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for this.